Romans 12, 13, help needy Christians be inventive in hospitality. I love that idea. Creativity is the birthplace of hospitality. And I think if we can get a vision for what hospitality could look like in our lives, and your version of hospitality is going to look different than my version of hospitality. And that's awesome. That's what actually makes it not Groundhog Day to visit one another. Welcome to Down to Earth. I'm Joyce Reese. And I'm Jessica de Sabatino. This is a show where we want to make deep theology easily understood and applied to our real lives. Here we discuss many things like the importance of story, kingdom theology of mission, the table of Jesus, becoming fully human, and much more. We're Joyce and Jess, and we're friends, pastors, and speakers. We thought perhaps we could work on this project together and have a little fun. Our goal is to talk about things we have passion for, connect with others about what matters to them, and together impact our world and honor God. All right, so today we're going to tackle the idea of Christian hospitality as something that is supposed to be a normative Christian practice. I sometimes say we don't live too much of the normal Christian life. Mm-hmm. Right? We live a lot around the values of the culture around us, and then we try to add Jesus in. Yeah, and I think when people hear the word hospitality, they often think of this is a job for senior citizens, for, for my grandma, right. or this is a job for my great aunt Betsy, or this is a job for if I'm a cultural person. So my in-laws are Italian and very hospitable, and we think that that gift is... Belongs to different cultures. Right. Right. Totally. Or even embedded in our idea of that word, I sometimes try so hard to find a different word, which we don't really have. We have to redeem that word, I think. Mm -hmm. But embedded in it is this idea of like, you know, depending on your age, like Martha Stewartism or like Pinterest, Pinterest perfection, you know, Uber something. I have 14 thumbs or 10. Right. So there is no crafting in my world. Or even that you have to be like uber foodie. Right. Right? Like somehow you got to be like really high bar, awesome, amaze bomb with the perfect house. Mm -hmm. You can't have any children then. Right. Or any messy pets. Or even the idea that you can't practice hospitality if you live in a dorm room. Right. Or an apartment. Right. Or on the street. Right. Like I have friends who really understand how to be hospitable Mm -hmm. and they have no home. Right. Right. So it's we got to move way past the cultural ideations and think about it from a kingdom perspective, from a biblical lens. Why is it really important and how do we practice it in the way? Yeah, this is one area I think that the world has actually tried to put a a, an idea of perfection across. I think and not in many other areas of the world is perfection sort of the goal, goal, right? But in hospitality, perfection is the goal. And I think it's a little bit HGTV. It's a little bit the Food Network. It's a little bit... Joanna Gaines. mm -hmm. Shout out to all of our faves on HGTV. Because they make things look so pretty and it looks like it only took them 20 minutes. And I, every year, Joyce, I would like to tell you that I decide that I'm going to do a Pinterest birthday party for my children. I have four of them. I am the least crafty person you've ever met in your life. Like I can't do, I stress out glue guns and me are never friends. My hair always gets glue. If you know me, you know, this is absolutely true. (laughs) But every year I think this is going to be a different year. This is going to be a year I'm very organized and I make these cakes from Pinterest. Oh my word. I have tried to do fondant. I've tried to do layered cakes. I've tried to, it's always like a disaster though, a disaster. And I'm always sweating. I've never taken the Wilton cake decorating course. No, Even but I I I yeah. have considered it. <laughs> but I realized that this would be a source of frustration. But anyways, I say all this to say I really want to have these perfect parties. I don't know why, cuz I think you think back to your own life and think, do you remember any perfect party? No, I remember crying at all my parties and right. Well, probably cuz you want to do it as an expression of love to make your kids Thank feel you special, right? Right. I'm not actually competing with the world of Pinterest. No, but this is important that you even bring up the idea of competition because you, I know you well enough to know that's not your heart orientation. But for many people, it isn't just perfection that they're aiming for. It is a type of competition. It's right. to I'm going to win the gold medal of birthday parties. Right. Or to feel better about themselves because 
there's a like a cultural value of success tied to that beauty or that perfectionism. Right. Even in our homes, I'm going to have the most beautiful shiplap wall. By the way, this is an aside. I'm very concerned with all the shiplap we're putting everywhere because this I is this is going to be like the wood paneling from the 70s. You know, people, our children are going to come into houses and go, what the heck were these people thinking? Putting up all, all, all like dirty wood, like up in every room and every room is more beautiful. It has more shiplap, uh-huh. painted shiplap, stained shiplap. There's so many ways you can use shiplap. This is a problem. That is for that is for free and not a theological discussion, but it's but but this there. idea yeah. I think holds us back from real hospitality. Right. I think we actually have an unrealistic view of what about what hospitality right. is. In my twenties, I started watching Jamie Oliver. Do you remember when he first came out? Yeah, yeah. And he had this show called The Naked Chef. Yeah. And every part he would make these. He just looked like he was throwing things together, and then every single episode he'd throw a party for all of his friends. Yeah. Well. I watched that and thought he may be the coolest person on the planet, and I was going to start throwing parties for my friends. The only problem was that I did not have the culinary skills, so I would invite all my friends over a couple hours before I'd finished. And it always turned out to a nightmare, like the fish would burn or the the risotto. like so. And I would be exhausted, so the friends would come over, I would feed them, and I would lay on the couch. (laughs) <laughs> I am. If you came to one of my dinner parties as a young adult, I'm so sorry. I know that they weren't fun, <laughs> and we tried to make them fun. But this idea, I think, and then and then I just went through a whole season of I do not throw parties. I only go to them. I'm a goer, not a thrower. Right. And that sort of became oh, I'm just not good at that. Right. And then you've got an excuse and an out, and you can ignore certain sections of the scriptures. Yeah. Right. Like that's what we do piecemeal. You know, well, that's not me. That's not my gift. Kind of like when we talked about responding, you know, to people who are marginalized in society, like a lot of us make excuses around that. But this is another one. And I would even say, like, this is maybe me being a bit extreme here, but from all the years of traveling all over the country preaching, I've come to the conclusion that this might be the most diminished gift in the body of Christ in Canada. Like is this meat? this is due to all the lasagnas yeah. and Caesar salads? Right. Now we're not dissing. If you've ever fed us a lasagna, lasagna with Caesar salad and toasted bread, we are not dissing that. Right. I'm thankful for whatever practices I've experienced. However, I think we could raise the bar, and that's kind of what I want to talk about a bit today. Yeah. Is what would it look like to the way I understand hospitality is to make room for the other. What would it look like to really do that intentionally, to cultivate life practices around that? Christine Pohl has written a book called Making Room. We'll put a link for it. But she says this in Making Room. She says, hospitality is not so much a task as it is a way of living our lives and sharing ourselves. A way of life cultivated over a lifetime. So, like, let's just be candid about this. This isn't like... And I have a value of hospitality now, and I'm going to be a maze bomb at it by next Tuesday, right? Like, this is a cultivated practice. Mm-hmm. It's like growing in prayer or, you know, growing in your biblical understanding or growing your intimacy with God. This is something that we just set ourselves on a path. Yeah. And hopefully by the time I'm 84, I'm going to be really, really good at being a hospitable person in the way of Jesus. And like all spiritual gifts, this is not about the outward, whatever you do. It's about it's about heart heart posture. So Mm -hmm. it's about ordering a dirty five dollar pizza and in making room. Well, here's a great story. I have a good friend, Marianne Rakowski, and a bunch of years ago, her and her husband moved to Kelowna, BC, to pastor. And Miriam works as a nurse. They had little kids or a bunch of kids, middle school aged, I guess, and then a new baby. And I remember Marianne telling me that when she moved there, she realized that the hospitality practices in their church community were not really healthy. She felt a lot of the competition, a lot of the I can't because my house isn't perfect or my kids are badly behaved or whatever. I don't have nice things. And she just thought, wow, there's something really unhealthy about this orientation. It's not really like Jesus. So she told me this story years later, but she went and packed up all her nice dishes and her nice cutlery and put it in boxes, I think, in her garage, or at least in a hidden cupboard. 
And she went out to a thrift store and bought all mismatched stuff for really cheap. And then she would go and pick up like just muffins from the grocery store, not even fancy muffins from a bakery. Okay. Just plain Jane, simple. She Brand didn't make them. Muffins. Right. Bran, right. Exactly. And she would invite people over for a cup of coffee and offer them a muffin. And she didn't pretend. Now, if you've ever done this, don't feel bad. She didn't pretend they didn't come from a grocery store. Right. She I, I have been guilty of doing that. She served them in the plastic uh-huh. uh, muffin Sobeys. Sobeys day old. Right. But she said it started to work because people started thinking, I could do this. Right. And they started opening their doors to one another. And any time we begin to share a table we begin to share more of real life. So what we want to do, at least initially in orientating ourselves to this idea of making room for the other is making room to share something authentic. So if you are aiming for something that's not your regular, right? If it's got to be extra special or fancy or uber something or other, that's the wrong orientation from the beginning. So aim for something that's really true to who you are. Right. And that doesn't mean we there aren't occasions where we do something fancy. Right. But that is not regular every day. Unless, of course, you have a five-course meal every day. In which case, feel free to invite me over <laughs> anytime. Well, a good example would be just like three weeks ago, we decided to have a big dinner at our house and invite anybody from our church to come because our good friends were visiting from Thailand and sharing about their church, which we're partnered with there. And so... A lot of people in my church don't know that I'm really passionate about food and I'm quite a good cook. Can I say that? So, I will mock you. Yeah, thing. go ahead and mock me. But <laughs> we did, like, she uh, is a good cook. we did a Laotian curry, and my friend Steph came and helped the day before. And one of my friends who was dropping by, as you do on your way from Winnipeg to Vancouver, or Morden, Manitoba, more precisely, we, you know, we just had extras. There's always extra people in my house. And so Dave peeled a lot of potatoes and just got in on it. But that food, I mean, it was really, really good the next day, right? And it was, I didn't make myself crazy on the day of. You got to make a plan. If you're going to have 35 or 40 people come to dinner, you got to do it, you know, with a bit of strategy. The gift was, yeah, this is something that I'm passionate about and I have some some gifts in them so I could share that more broadly with the community. So there is some room for feasting or for bringing, you know, those special gifts. I'm not saying leave them at the door and just go get Sobeys muffins if you actually have some skills in the kitchen. What I'm saying is that, that the orientation isn't to be competitive. Mm-hmm. It isn't to be proud, right? It's to offer a gift with some humility and to open the door to make some room. And I think... It's sharing whatever you have, time, space, resource, a welcome. You could be hospitable inviting someone to go on a walk with you. Right. It doesn't even have to be around food. Right. It could be inviting someone, you know, just to share something of your regular life. And if we can begin there, you know, orientating ourselves first to the community of faith. There seems to be something in the scriptures that says, make room for one another. Right. And when you did to everybody, especially those in the family of God. Right. And Romans 12, 13, help needy Christians be inventive in hospitality. I so, love that idea. Creativity is the birthplace of hospitality. Right. And I think if we can get a vision for what hospitality could look like in our lives, and your version of hospitality is going to look different than my version of hospitality. Yeah. And that's awesome. That's what actually makes it not Groundhog Day. <laughs> To visit one another. Right. Over and over the same. Yeah. I also think this is a a real need in North American culture. They say that most people don't know their neighbors. And if you live in the North, like we do, this is by necessity. Really, it's not because we're unfriendly. It's because it's so cold. If you're not from Calgary, I've lived here 18 months. Now, when people say cold, it's like underestimation of how cold it is. This year in February, I actually thought, Joyce, I thought... I'm not sure God ever intended for us to live in cold places like this. I actually think hell might be a cold place. And we can discuss that theologically on another podcast. But anyways, it's the worst. It's so cold. If if the Lord doesn't tell you to move here, don't move here. It's so cold. And I'm going to defend Calgary because I love that we get Chinooks. And it all melts. Okay. The Chinooks baloney. We had like one Chinook this year. It was like minus 90. And then then it was, oh, it's it's minus 10. It's a Chinook. We have more than 26 consecutive days 
where it was minus 20 or more. And so, if you are from the south of America or somewhere warm, your body can't understand how cold that is don't let anybody tell you from the north it's not really that bad if you dress appropriately you'll be warm no you won't you won't be warm not on any not on any occasion will be you you'll be warm last night one of my neighbors said well it's great we're all kind of out of our houses now and connecting again and i hadn't seen her since last summer we're not wearing parkas so this is there's some truth to hibernating and not really right. seeing one another it doesn't necessarily get facilitated naturally so my point is they say that most people don't know their neighbors and and for for practical reasons that is true and I, but i also think it's because we don't create space yep. For we uh, drive into our garage and close the garage and garage door openers the to. bane of yeah. America, right. North America. Compromises community, that's for sure. I think the other thing is we don't have a drop-in culture. No. Like years ago, I went to visit some relatives in the Netherlands. And I grew up with, you know, an immigrant mother. She's Frisian, let's be clear, not Dutch. We can discuss this another time. But my mom immigrated as a teenager with her family. And so I grew up with her kind of cultural orientation, which was an open door policy. People right. dropped by all the time. And always there's pot of coffee. Usually there was a little bit of baking, something to offer people. That was just normal sort of European cultural practice. Yeah. Well, I went to the Netherlands and I realized, no, they have set times every day that they stop and they take a 15 minute coffee break. And if you happen to be working on someone's house like the carpenter was this day, and he was doing something with their garage doors, then you just come in at 10 o'clock and have a cup of coffee. That's just the way it is. And same within the afternoon. So the whole village stops, everybody has coffee, and wherever you are, it is an open door. So yeah. the, it was crazy, though, because the carpenter came in and sat down at the table, and I looked at him, and I about freaked out, because he looked almost identical to my brother Jamie. So I was like... I just said to him, I don't know who you are, but I know that we are related. <laughs> yeah, and I think in different parts of North America as well, that is true. So my mom is from the East Coast, right. and she said, all growing up, you would just look over, oh, there would be somebody in your house drinking tea. And you didn't even have to say anything. Right. Sometimes the idea of hospitality is just being together. together, which is why we know that this is not just a gift that is for the extrovert in all of us that wants to have a big right. party. Sometimes hospitality is just sitting there with people, I can remember when my brother died, I think the greatest gift people gave to me and to my family was just coming and sitting. Yeah, I call it the ministry of presence. Yeah, like I, I had a friend, Debbie, who had been my friend for a long time, and I, we'd sort of, we'd lived in different places. And But when my brother died, it was probably the most profound moment I had with anybody. I just, I was playing the piano poorly as I, as I make a practice. <laughs> and she just sat in my living room. And there was something really powerful about that. And that was maybe the strongest gift of hospitality right. that anybody has ever given you. Yeah. Just That's sitting powerful, yep. and not saying anything. And I don't know. And, and I think, you know, it doesn't have to be as extreme as a death sometimes. Right. Just like you're a new mom and you're exhausted and you just need somebody to just come and sit with you sure. and, and say you nothing. Do, you look at the cultural studies right now. There's a cultural study about men in their mid thirties and older and like, what are they struggling with and why the high incidence of suicide among professional men in their early fifties, why collapse of mental health and high incidence of depression. And I just read a, an interesting study a couple of weeks ago. We'll throw it up on the website, but the study showed that the number one crippling factor for men right now is loneliness. Yeah. They don't have intimate friends. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, just the hospitable act of sharing life yeah. and meaningful relationship. Same, same thing came out of a study in Vancouver. I'll see if I can find that and throw it up on the website as well. The pandemic that has swept Vancouver is loneliness and isolation. Right. They say now that all that drug addiction, really, they're beginning to see as an issue, not of bad choices. It's social connectivity. Yeah. So people who become heroin addicts don't get up one morning and think, I think I'll try drugs. No, they're, they're socially not connected. Mm -hmm. I, I sent you an article, and we put this one up as well, that talks about how touch is really absent from our society and how the levels of serotonin in our brain are not able to sustain themselves without touch from one another. And this idea that we can show hospitality online, I just think, no. Because no. that, that same study you sent me, Jess, showed that 
if you have a, a social media connection, it doesn't release the serotonin right. in the brain right. and to get a funny text from a friend or a kind happy birthday. It doesn't do anything to your brain. Right. It's the face-to-face yeah. actual touching of one another that matters. Yeah. And, the, you know, interesting that study talked about how your hugs with people actually need to be longer than five seconds. Yeah. My husband is brilliant at this. I always, I, I learned to ask for what I need when we were married, you know. So I just say, can I get a hug? And then he gives me these like really long hugs. Well, he's been gone for three weeks and I just keep telling my kids, you got to come and hug mom because I don't have dad around. Because right. maybe intuitively, I didn't know the science of it, but I know when I need that. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of people don't know. But so you're married and you have kids, but 37 or 36% of people don't aren't married and don't have kids. And so I was- we have to create room for that to happen. Yeah. And hospitality, the gift of hospitality allows that to happen. I remember one time years and years ago, broke my ankle. I was not able to ride my bike. I didn't have a car. I was on transit. It's a long story, but I was isolated and I had no phone. Did you break your ankle on your bike? No, I broke my ankle dancing. That's a long story. <laughs> Anyways, Jess mocks me for my Please send her clumsiness. Do not <laughs> ride your bike anymore. Do not double your children on your bike. <laughs> Do not. Just send her a lot of mail saying, thus saith the Lord. It would really help a sister out here. I'll tell you some good stories sometimes about my accident proneness. They're not good stories. They're terrible stories. But I did manage to break my toe recently with a mug of bacon fat. Anyway, I had this experience of profound isolation. Three weeks where I hadn't really interacted with anybody much and no one had come to my house. I remember going to shopper's drug mart to buy something and I was on crutches and the woman passed me the change and her hand grazed mine and it felt like an electric current just this exchange of buying something and it really jolted me like it wasn't I didn't get a you know a shock like we get in Calgary every five minutes from the dry weather I went outside and I began to cry and I thought what is wrong with me and I realized because the Lord just showed me like you've had no physical touch for weeks now All of a sudden, I had this compassion for elderly people who are shut in, the old guys that I see hanging around the coffee shops, because they just are isolated and they know enough, like, I got to go be where people are. Mm -hmm. But we got to find ways to be hospitable to them, right? Or to whoever it is that's around us, that's in an isolated place. Right. I actually think with the hypersexualization in our culture, regardless of how you slice it or dice it or hyper... Culture is hypersexualized, but I think that has actually taken away the gift of intimacy with one another because everything, everything we do that is sexualized, so we don't touch each other anymore because we're afraid if I touch you, you're going to think I'm in love with you or I want to have sex with you or, and, but I actually think the root of it is that we're no longer hospitable to one another. So we no longer have instances where it is natural and normal for us to embrace one another, to to have regular interactions with one yeah. another. Or to even have an intimate conversation yeah. and not then feel like, oh, that maybe I'm weird. in lo- or maybe I'm in love with this person. Right. Right. Like it doesn't we don't have to always go there in friendship. We can be meaningful, deep friends with with people that doesn't have to have a sexualized tone to it. Right, that can be intimate. Yeah. Deborah Hirsch talks about this at length in her book, Redeeming Sex. We'll put a link to that as well. So how do you get some orientating practices? How do you find a way that works with your rhythm of life? What would be some beginning steps that we could take to make room for the other? And especially, I want to I wanna provoke us to think about making room for the other that would be forgotten. Right? So it's one thing to make room for your friends to say, I'm going to start here, or to make room for some folks from the church that you don't really know much. Or, but where, how can you begin to get eyes to see the one that would be left out? Right. You know, I tell my kids regularly, you know, at recess, I want you to watch for the kids that don't get included in play. I want you to watch for the ones that don't have food. Now, our school has a rule no sharing food. It's the weirdest rule. I understand parents with allergies, allergies. don't send us letters, but but I, a you know, rule. I, I think it. I think my kids need to figure out like if they saw a kid that consistently didn't have a snack or nothing like what the other kids have, 
then maybe we could go and talk to the school administration or the teacher and we could provide something for the school that the school could give that kid, right? Like there's ways to get around that. Yeah, and I think what we have to get real about is that this is not a natural orientation of heart. So if you're waiting for it to feel right or to, I mean, as and you see this with children, we tend to, and I, I know we don't do this out loud, but the idea that people are left out and that some people rise to the top yeah. and is, then everybody's trying. is a natural phenomenon. So if we are going to orientate ourselves towards a spirit of hospitality, this is going to be like swimming upriver. Totally. It's not going to be easy, nor is it going to be natural, and it is sometimes going to be a pain. Right. And so we have to cultivate a compassionate heart. Mm -hmm. Like, and obviously I'm talking about, you know, my kids, but that's because that had to get cultivated in me first. We can't pass on to our children something we haven't got ourselves. Right. So trying to teach them compassion, trying to invite them to have a heart posture where they are asking Jesus on a daily basis, give me eyes to see, give me ears to hear, give me a heart to respond. Right. That's a basic prayer we should all learn to pray many times a day. Right. And yeah, I mean, I think growing up, I saw this, my parents really modeled this for us. Mm -hmm. Just about every Christmas, every Easter, every Thanksgiving, we had, and as a child, uh, and this is horrible, we, we called it weirdos at our table. They were not weirdos. They were some of them. And now looking back as an adult, I could I can see what my parents were trying to do. Yeah. We had people who had mental problems, usually a handful of people with mental problems, a handful of people who were just lonely, yeah. and a handful of people. But it was never just like the family that had kids our age. I used to be so mad because I used to think, why can't they just invite like regular people who will bring me presents? Right. <laughs> they would invite people who would come. I, I remember one Christmas, one of the gentlemen that we invited came with a belt with butter attached to his belt, chunks of butter attached to his belt. And he wore a hard helmet the entire dinner. Christmas dinner. He did not take the butter off his belt. He used it to butter things during the meal. Oh, he was wearing a like a safety vest and he did not want to take it off. But you know, like those stories, my siblings and I have gone back to those stories and said they were some of the richest stories right. because we recognize that Jesus was in the other, right. that he actually presented himself at our Christmas table with sticks of butter right. and a hard hat. And the amazing thing is your parents then gave you a gift that far exceeded any present they could have given you at right. Christmas, right? Yeah. We, we have a practice of always looking around to see who would be not having a place to go, right? right? So, and that is a value. We don't ever have Christmas with our little family or just like, we don't have any extended family here. So we always make sure. So this year, you know, if we didn't have anybody with helmets and butter, but we had some friends who are single. And one of our friends is in her 60s. She is a legend, a legend in Canada with the poor. And she's an artist and she's incredibly smart and just really gifted. And my kids adore her. But I realized, yeah, being with the family because of the trauma she grew up in is quite hard. So I didn't know if she'd come. But she did. And then we included a couple of young adults whose parents are missionaries in Brazil, and they wouldn't have a family to be with. So they were with us. And then we included one of my husband's friends from the rowing club. It's a single guy, and he was RCMP, and he had a workplace injury, and he's not able to work. And so he came. Well, you know what was amazing is we had, between Susan and Matt— we had these really smart, eccentric, unique people like Matt builds his own airplane and he flies gliders and like just an interesting guy, right? And Susan's got these crazy stories of her life, with street entrenched people and the gift they are to her. And, and then you've got these young adults just drinking it in, right? And my kids watching all of this. It was one of the most special Christmas Eves ever. So realizing, yeah, like we're not, we're not being noble. We found a secret yeah. to the heart of God, that if you make room for the other, you will always meet Jesus in the other. Right. And and I also think it brings some hilarity to our lives, totally. too. Yeah. And that's okay. That You Color. don't have to be, like, so serious. We used to, my dad, every night of the week, for most of my growing up lives, talked to people who were had mental health issues. Well, this is before the days of call waiting and before the days of call display. Well, maybe there was call display, but we were too cheap to get it. So right. so we always answered the phone because it could have been a boy calling. So I always answered the phone. <laughs> well, this man 
David, he would often say, hi, Jessica, it's David. Can I play your, my flute for you? He was not a good flute player. And he'd play solo after solo on his flute. I'd have to talk to his canary. And But, you know, that gave me an orientation to be able to... I wasn't afraid of people with mental health issues. Right. I knew that they could love God. I knew that they could experience God. And I knew that they could teach me something. Yeah. So as an adult, that changed the way I practice. So hospitality doesn't even have to be... It's just making room for somebody. It doesn't even have to be a meal or... Or a, sometimes hospitality just means taking 20 minutes every day with somebody and saying, are you alive? Are you okay? I'm yeah. thinking about you. I'm praying for you. Yeah. What do you need today? Yeah, it's great. And I think the other thing I want to, you know, maybe highlight for us is, yeah, we've talked about the special occasions, Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, Easter, Thanksgiving, right? Because these are times when people feel profound loneliness. It's exacerbated. Like suicide season is December if you work with street entrenched people. And there's a reason. So many trigger days where everyone else has a place to belong and you don't and whatnot. But we also have to get the regular practices, the Saturday brunches that aren't just for our family or the Friday night treat night in our house where we include others or Sunday afternoons where we just invite people back for a bowl of soup. Like, simple, right? But making room for the others. I can just hear, you know, somebody thinking, yeah, but I don't have stuff. Like, I wouldn't be able to afford to feed a lot of people or whatever. And I I remember a few years ago, we were pretty hand-to-mouth, working a bunch of jobs, trying to keep food on our table. And I like to garden. I had a beautiful garden. (sighs) Then we had a young guy, his parents were missionaries in Mexico, and we had him living with us. And I don't know, there's some people came to help with the studio we were building. So I had a few extras, it was going to be lunchtime. And then Josue, the the guy that was living with us, he found some hippies, some French Canadian hippies, and he brought them back because he said, oh, they'll, they'll be lunch. And So I was looking around and realizing we're going to have 13 people for lunch, and I have no idea what to make. I don't have much in the way of protein. Like, I just didn't know what to do. So I went and stood out at my garden and I prayed for a minute, five minutes of quiet. I had a baby and I had a toddler and that was a miracle that I had five minutes to myself. So I prayed and I said, Lord, what can I feed? I need an imagination. I need to know how I can feed these people. And then just clear as a bell, I remembered that Vikram Vij had a good recipe in his first book about there's something to do with kale and lentils. And I just thought, oh, yeah, 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 I can make a big pot of that. And so I did. We sat down to eat, you know, an hour and a half later or whatever, and I said, so it's a very simple meal. I made us a, basically a vegan lentil dish on rice. So it'll be hearty and it'll fill us up, but it's pretty simple. And the girl, the French-Canadian girl, Emma, she sort of looked like, did someone, how? And I said, what? She said, I'm vegan. No one ever makes vegan food. Like, and I just thought, wow, this is an interesting open door. Like, God knew what was going to best bless her and knew my limitations, my lack of imagination for what to do. That led to a conversation about whether they wanted to, did they need anything? And I found out they'd been on the road for a bunch of days. And so I just said, well, do you want to have a shower? And like, they refused because they thought they would ruin my towels. And I was like, no, 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 you have to understand, I don't care about stuff like that. And so that day, hospitality became giving them towels and bars of soap and shampoo. And they emerged from the showers later, you know, just feeling quite glorious. And they hung out with us for a long time. We had quite a profound conversation about Jesus. And they felt like they could ask questions that they'd never been able to ask anybody. And I just thought, hey, it was just a simple act of making room. We made room for Josue. Josue knew that we would make room for the French-Canadian hippies. And then they realized with the vegan lunch and and then the showers that they had room to ask questions, Mm -hmm. right? So it's this like, it was quite a profound day, I think, for all of us. But it came out of my lack that I needed the Lord to provide an idea. And there was more that emerged than we would have thought for all of us, right? It's days like that that we need to consider. Can I just bring a couple of scriptures? And we talked about Romans 12, 13 being inventive in hospitality. 1 Peter 4, 8 to 10 says, Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. I love that little caveat. It tells us Peter kind of knew 
that we might complain about this. And then he says, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. And this is the idea that it doesn't have to look same, same. And then Hebrews 13, 1 and 2 says, keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. So my friend in Vancouver, Karen Reed, runs a house called Parker House, Mm. and it is a beautiful house. And she does this so for strangers. And, you know, she has this big, big house, and she's a single lady, and she started opening up her house for people that would be coming through Vancouver, or people that would just need a place to stay, or young adults who are kind of in an in-between stage would come and stay with her for a number of months and weeks. And she said hundreds and hundreds of people through her house. And, you know, it's funny, the reaction, because although the scripture is quite clear that we would be hospitable, I think a culture of fear has taken us over. Yeah. And I, I remember people saying to Karen, well, like, aren't you afraid that you're going to be stabbed in the night? And she said, no, this is this is the call of the gospel to us. Right. And she's had so many profound conversations with people just over a shared meal, over a warm bed, and being able to just provide without looking for anything in return. No hidden agenda. Yeah. No, she's not doing an altar call at the end of please leave this room and also say this prayer. It's just the gospel in lived action. out. Yeah, yeah, and she's a single woman in her 50s who is taken a step of faith to obey Jesus and just to do She's this is quite, quite powerful. You know, a num- number of years ago, living in a community house, I had the gift of living in community for 17 years before I met Callum and we got married when we were 35 and 36. And he also had uh, an orientating life around living in the context of Christian community that was quite intentional. But the years that I lived in the downtown east side, which were quite numerous, we lived in one of the oldest houses, second oldest house in the city. That isn't very old for anybody listening from somewhere else. It was like built in 1887 because the city burned down in the late 1860s. So, and yeah, just, but for us, it was quite old. It was quite beautiful and special. It was housing that the poor wouldn't necessarily be able to access, but we could afford. And we were really conscious about not stealing housing from the poor. Over time, we ended up having two apartments, ground floor and top floor, and there were some girls that lived in the apartment on the middle floor that we tried to gain a better relationship with. But I said to some of my housemates from the very beginning with the first apartment, I want to keep one room for hospitality. Now, you're living in the downtown east side. I'm running a charity. I'm living mostly with seminary students. We did not have a lot of extra money. So to do that meant we had to come up with an extra $500 a month to pay for the rent on the spare room. But I felt really strongly about it. So for a very long time, I paid that extra money because I just think you got to listen. If God convicts you of something, even if you're living in community, then you have to let it cost you, right? Right. And so for the first long while, months, maybe even into a couple years, I paid for that guest room. And over time, I remember my housemate Helen coming to me and saying, you know what, I feel like the Lord's challenged me to, to contribute some to that room. And so she started doing that. And we began this like life orientation. It was so amazing, the people that God sent to us from all over the world, all walks of life, nations kind of coming to the downtown east side and experiencing the gift of God and the people that live there and occasionally, you know, needing to make room for someone who was in distress. We had space. We didn't have to say, oh, I'm sorry, I can't do anything about you your situation, I'm going to send you to big not-for-profit that has room for you. Today, I saw an article, finally, this is getting some traction nationally, but a movement, it's a network of people that have decided to use their spare rooms to make room for street-entrenched youth. And there is some wisdom around it and some orientating practices and even a bit of training so that you understand how to be present to the street entrenched young teenagers and young adults that would be coming through your door. But I felt so excited. I put it up on my Facebook page and said, finally, this idea is getting some traction in major cities across Canada because we have space, we have stuff, and we mustn't forget to share it. To not live in a a posture of fear, like you were mentioning, Jess. Yeah, and I think if we're 
if we're not careful, I mean, I can count dozens and dozens of families who, who live in the suburbs. And I, I know many of these people really well. And you have to book like a month in advance to even have a meal with them. So this idea that it's us for no more, I think has contributed to the rise of mental health issues, to anxiety, to depression. I think all of this, trying to cloister ourselves is never the posture of the gospel. The gospel is always that we would open okay. ourselves up and say, what I have, you have. I, I think it's a problem when we read Acts chapter 4 and go, well, that was weird that they shared everything. Right. Okay. When we read that, and that doesn't seem, that seems antithetical to the way we live our lives, I think we have to ask ourselves the question, so how do we, how do we get back there? Right, and what would it look like? for us to live the normal Christian life that's described. In the yeah, and we might not get back there right away. We might not get back there tomorrow, but we can start doing little things. Totally. You know, I um, one of the best passages for hospitality in the Old Testament is Isaiah 58. Yeah, and we think of this as like that chapter is like about, you know, caring for the poor, and it is. But there's this passage there, uh, verses 7 and 8, it says, Is it not to share your food? with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter. And when you see the naked, to clothe them and not turn away from your own flesh and blood. And then it talks about the blessing of God breaking in on you. I remember realizing, like, it isn't to point them to the not-for-profit. It isn't to say, well, I'll volunteer some hours at Alpha House, although I think that's really good to serve at a homeless shelter. But it's to say, I'm going to make room in my own space and with my own stuff. So even a small practice we have is when we go out for dinner, my kids very rarely eat everything. We often have leftovers and we get that to go and we'll go and find someone outside that is hungry Mm -hmm. and offer them the pieces of pizza that didn't get eaten or whatever. And so our kids have learned like we share our own stuff, right? And I mean, I think this scripture has a lot of interesting layers to it because this whole section about not to turn away from your own flesh and blood reminds us that hospitality must start at home. So, I mean, I think this is a whole other podcast that we could talk about, care for the elderly, our elderly relatives, the cranky aunt who drives you insane in the membrane. And we see that. And I think we joke about this a little bit, like Christmas is a very stressful time because everybody's got somebody. Crazy uncle coming over. Right. But I think the scripture points us to sharing our things with those who are us, who are our own flesh and blood. and And I think in some ways, if we can't start hospitality there, we're never going to be successful with the person. No, then it will be like petting the poor when we look for the marginalized person. Yeah. Then it'll be like a project. Yeah. So unless it comes out of a real heart orientation that is natural and normal, yeah. and sometimes we naturalize that just by maybe hospitality starts with eating with your family, right. having a meal with your parents or Which your isn't children. Which is a normative practice anymore, right? Right. Like, and I think that's why we've lost hospitality because yeah. we don't ha- we don't start it with our own flesh and blood. Yeah. I was reading something, I can't remember where, probably on one of those Facebook things that floated around, but just the, if you want to have a healthy family, here's a few steps that you have to do, right? And one of them is eat together at least once a week around a table with no devices and no TV on. And I remember thinking, what? We do that three times a day in my house. I can't even imagine that that isn't... You know, or like Jamie Oliver, you mentioned him earlier, like the Ministry of Food, that guy, he, uh, that's the name of one of his shows in the UK, but he went around and realized there was moms and dads who had never learned to cook. There was an old man, he was widowed and he, his wife had always done the cooking and there was a single mom who had ordered takeaway every single day. Her little girl sat on the floor and ate out of takeaway containers. Mm -hmm. And she was five years old and had never eaten at a table with any food her mom had prepared. And so he taught them together. And then the thing was that the older fellow and this young mom had to then teach a few of their friends. And a month later, whatever, Jamie comes back to see what's happened. And it's powerful, right? Yeah. And I, I actually think we can substitute and I'm using quotation marks here, ministry for this gift of hospitality in our own families. I remember talking to one young person that was at our house and his parents were in the ministry. And he said to to me, we never eat together because my parents are always doing the ministry. This is before we had children. And I remember thinking, 
I'm never doing that. Well, yeah, and it's hard. I, I mean, I understand it's hard. We have appointments that we have to get to and crises we have to manage and people that need us. But if we are not careful and we don't produce that spirit of hospitality, we get into a gospel of works. And I think hospitality calls us back to rest in some way, yeah. calls us back to actually being with one another, yeah. being with God. And the idea that it's about simplicity, yeah, right? Like there's nothing fancy about the kingdom. It's a down to earth. I mean, there's a reason we named the podcast this way, but it's, it's on the ground. It's yeah. a real life lived. And, you know, I remember teaching on this a bunch of years ago and there was a university student who the light bulbs went on. And she just thought, oh. So she figured out in her dorm who no one else wanted to hang out with. And she started inviting this young woman to come and have noodles, ramen noodles, because she had a kettle. And they could, you know, eat ramen noodles. Now, not necessarily super healthy, but she made room for the other and the one that would be excluded in a dorm context. And I thought, good on you. The penny has dropped. And of course, it it wasn't her being noble and this other girl being needy. It was a transformational practice for the, the one who made room. She was then shaped into the likeness of Jesus because she began to see what he sees and the beauty and gift in the other. And it changed her judgments and her pride and lots of other things. So, so get out there and make room. Make room. Do it up. Thanks for listening to another episode of Down to Earth. We hope you've enjoyed listening and feel inspired to grow in your relationship with God and to engage your life in ways that shape your culture and community. If you enjoyed today's episode, please take a moment and leave a review on iTunes. Not only does it let us know how we're doing, but it helps other people find the show. Remember, if you have any comments, questions, or feedback, please leave them in the comments on this episode at downtoearthpodcast.com.